We would like to begin by acknowledging that Parachutes Offices uh, is situated upon traditional territories. The territories include the Wenda, the Anishwabi, um, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the First Credit, our New Credit First Nations. As this conference is taking place virtually, we would like to invite all attendees to learn and reflect on what First Nations, Inuit, or Métis land their offices and homes might be located on at nativeland.ca. Um, we would also like to thank our gold sponsor, Brown Healthcare, home of the Hip Saver, home of Hip Saver Canada, and the exclusive Canadian distributor of the world's leading hip protector for the generous support of the fall, Canadian Fall Prevention Virtual Conference. You can check out your delicate package for more information on them. Over the next hour, you will see five great presentations. Each, present, each presentation will run for approximately 10 minutes, and then we'll have um, the question, a short question and answer period at the end of this afternoon's session. Um, please use the, the Q&A box again to submit any questions. Um, you have for the presenters. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Our first presenter is, is Valerie Smith from Parachute. Valerie Smith holds an MA in International and Comparative Education and is the Director of Programs at Parachute. She oversees all of Parachute's campaigns and programs and helps to support Parachute's extensive network of community partners across Canada. She is skilled in managing behavior change program and has a strong community engagement background. Valerie has presented at, num at a number of events and conferences around the world on injury prevention issues. Please welcome Val, Val to present on Parachute's hashtag Fall Prevention Canada campaign. Val? Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm actually just gonna take a few minutes to talk about the Fall Prevention Canada campaign. Um, and to provide some context on some videos that we're going to be sharing shortly. Um, so in, uh, in earlier in the year in 2020, um, right as COVID was starting to, to hit us all fairly hard, um, Parachute received funding from the Government of Canada's Emergency uh, Community Support Fund and the Community Foundations of Canada um, to roll out a campaign focused on um, fall prevention resources for older adults. Um, and we really wanted to roll this campaign out in the context of COVID-19 um, and the growing, oh, I'm getting some, can, any, can everyone hear me okay? I'm just gonna switch, I'm just gonna switch to my phone. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, so the approach we took for this campaign was to reach out to adult children of seniors um, that were and are checking in on their parents, their older parents. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry if um, I'm having some technology issues. I'm gonna try to get through this quickly and then play the videos. Um, so the campaign was basically to inspire caregivers and older adults uh, that they are checking in with during isolation um, to access exercise resources that the older adults needed for fall prevention. Um, <clears throat> we worked with the Injury Prevention Center in Alberta to develop evidence-based resources um, to help older adults stay connected during COVID-19 at home and to make their home a safe space, as well as adding movement into their daily routines. Uh, what I'm gonna be showing you next is a campaign um, component where we, we worked closely with a Canadian comedian, Brittle Star, um, to develop short and humorous videos um, that addressed a serious topic on fall, preven fall prevention in older adults. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Michael to play the videos. Hey, Mom. Hello, son. How are you and Dad today? Just checking in. Oh, we're fine. 
Still sticking close to home. A wee bit bored, but we're fine. That's great. Hey, I saw in the news that falls are the leading cause of injury hospitalization in Canada for seniors. Is that right? Yeah, and apparently 20 to 30% of seniors fall each year. That's awful. At the same time, do they know why? What? It must be quite slippery where they live. No, 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 not, not the same seniors. 20 to 30% of seniors in general. Oh, that's good. I felt bad for them. Mom, this is serious. If you or dad fall, you could end up in hospital. Listen, four out of five Canadians, 65 and older, who end up in hospital for an injury are there because of falls. Oh my, that sounds serious. It is. But I found some great info on how you and dad can do your own fall prevention at home. That sounds great. Yeah, it's some really simple tips and exercises. Tips and what? Exercises. Mom. Mom. I know your screen isn't frozen. Connection no good. Talk later. I'll send you the link. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. So we, we do have two more videos um, in the same context, um, that lighthearted approach. And um, I will share the link to them as well as some background on the campaign um, in case anyone missed it uh, with the glitchy technology. Uh, thanks very much. Back to you, Kathy. Hi, thanks for that, Val. Um, now we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Suzanne Baker from Nova Scotia. Um, Suzanne Baker has been in her position as the Falls and Injury Coordinator for, for 15 years and has worked in the Department of Health and Wellness and Nova Scotia Health um, for the majority of that time. Suzanne attended school, has attended school for 14 years and holds a collection of degrees with a plan um, to continue her love of learning. Please welcome Suzanne Baker for her presentation on functional independence in acute care. Suzanne? Suzanne, we can't hear you. Okay, can okay. you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm got to share this. So share screen. And can you see it? Oops. Not quite yet. No? Okay. Well, let's hope it comes. Can you try again? These tef technical difficulties are um, not good. So that's what I want. Hmm. It's telling me that it's not allowing me to share it oh, for okay. some reason. Same thing. Um, maybe we'll have Michael. Um, can you share Suzanne's? Uh, presentation and then she can tell you when to switch the slides. I'll get that set up. Just give me a moment. Thanks, Michael. This doesn't count for my time, does it, Kathy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, always technical issues. Even if we were in person, there'd be technical issues. So oh, yes. That's so true. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So um, I'm sweating. You can tell my yeah. face is red. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. 
There we go. So Yay. just um, when you need your slides changed, just say, say next. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Suzanne Baker. I'm the Fall and Injury Prevention Coordinator, and this is a little research project that uh, I started pre-COVID, um, pre and it's called Functional Fitness and Acute Care. Next slide, please. So it's taking place on the South Shore in Liverpool, Nova Scotia, in a small rural town um, with the population is 2,653, and that's just a bridge that enters on into the town. And the picture on the right is a picture of the Queen's General Hospital and of course the beauty of South Shore and it's a medical unit with 26 beds. Next. So the whole idea about this program and the objective was basically just to evaluate the fe feasibility of adding a program, um, an evidence-based program, which was the tiered exercise program, which comes from uh, Western Ontario uh, at University of Western. And um, just to put it in basically routine care on inpatient units, uh, just to see if we could promote early functional independence and basically um, prevent the decline of older patients that are admitted to hospital. So the program itself is three levels and it does contain exercises that are for sitting, um, being in bed and also if they're standing. Next. I think a lot of people think when they think of feasibility study, they think of businesses, but really what's this about? Again, it's just about fitting something into everyday practice. It's a project for nursing, um, because I think quite often people think that mobility is the responsibility of um, physio. And we think that it's an interdisciplinary sort of team uh, activity. So that was sort of our plan. Next. So we all know about what the hazards of mobility are, and this just sort of goes through them. The highlight for me is the one on the bottom left, which says about increased risk of falls due to weakness, which quite ha which happens quite often. So there's lots of reasons we've um, when we've tried to implement when we've started to implement it. Some of the reasons and barriers that we faced were um, that sometimes the patients thought they were too ill. Um, sometimes patients and visitors uh, had the perception of needing permission from somebody to tell them, yes, you can do this. The fear of falling, we had some, you know, role confusion as in who's supposed to be doing this. And again, sometimes our environment's very busy, um, especially uh, pre-COVID, just as we were sort of ramping up, it became quite busy. So in terms of priority, sometimes, of course, I think things like this end up falling to the bottom. So uh, that was a bit of an issue. Next. We want to know why it's important. Well, there's lots of good reasons, obviously, improving the quality of life. You know, we know that deconditioning is a major problem when people are in the hospital. And every day that patients are actually in um, or having bed rest, they're losing up to three to 5% of their um, uh, muscle mass. So there's quite a bit of atrophy going on. And so this is what happens is it helps and includes, of course, helping to maintain that mobility and that independence. Next. These are some of the benefits of getting out of bed while you're in hospital. But these benefits are not only for the patient, because if the patient's doing this, then it obviously is there's many benefits to the staff too, because it makes their job a little bit easier. Next. So this is um, a placemat that uh, we borrowed actually, um, and it's from Sunnybrook Health Science Center in, in Toronto. And it's a placemat that we've put in rooms so that we just sort of are constantly, it's sort of there to remind uh, the patients and about them actually doing and coming to that mindset that when you come into the hospital, you might be able, you might have been able to eat by yourself, toilet and groom, all those things by yourself. So you should continue being able to do those if possible, or maybe with a little bit of support. Next. So this is essentially what the, the program looked like. Uh, we have managers on board. We've got, um, so I have the manager, the assistant manager, the team lead and support from physio. I've engaged physicians by um, telling them about the program and of course they support it. Right now with the RN champions, we were hoping our team lead would be that, be doing that role, having that role, but we've basically now are implementing that. Um, we did education about hospital acquired disability and I also did the tiered exercise program, uh, the tiered exercise program. And it was actually uh, done via, we waited and waited and waited because we were with COVID, in, in the middle of COVID, but I didn't want to wait anymore. So we decided to do it 
actually virtually. Um, and then I got feedback and evaluation from that, which was quite interesting because it was on a scale of one to five and some of them were ones and a bunch of them were fives. So again, I think it uh, just shows there's different type of learners and obviously virtually was not probably the best choice, but it was our only choice at the time. So we've what we did was we started um, the program and running PDSA cycles in two rooms and basically collecting observational data. Um, there's a book for all the staff to write down any of their issues. It's anonymous so they can rant away and say what they feel. Um, so we've learned a lot from that because basically I'm asking nursing staff, how can you put this in place and how can you and how will it work for you in a positive way? So basically they're leading the, re the research in terms of how it's going. So a PDSA cycle is um, plan, do, study, act. So we start out that day, we wake up and we say, okay, what are we gonna do? Well, today we're gonna try to implement these exercises. Uh, and basically they try, to, they try to do it. If something comes up, then they record, well, we couldn't do it today because of this, or this was really hard, or this isn't working, or this went really well. And then we make changes. And then the, another two days, we do the same cycle over again with the new information and feedback that we got. So one thing that I've learned from this really is that I think it's a lot about um, behavior change. Uh, and so that's a big piece. So we have to keep that in mind. The education, like I said, was virtual. Um, we did the evaluation. I just interviewed actually an RN last week and got quite a bit of awesome feedback from her telling me, okay, here's some things that we could do. And that we'll talk about a little bit as we move on. Okay, next. <coughs> Excuse me. Next. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so the program actually includes other other areas too, and it's the end pajama paralysis. So what we also want is staff to get patients up and get them dressed every single day in their home clothes. That was an issue during COVID because we didn't have visitors, so we couldn't do that as much. Um, we've run into a problem in the morning because report is at eight o'clock and shift change is at seven. And so it's difficult for them. So we're working around um, trying to see how we can do that. Uh, the doctors have put a note in that every patient needs to be up and dressed every three times, like, and they need to be sitting in their chair three times a day for every meal. And we sort of track it with this little tracking sheet, which is just for now. Um, and if they did any exercises, if they're up in the chair, if they're dressed, and if they did 30 minutes in their chair, and if they did any exercises. The population really that we're targeting are the ones that are in bed, the ones that actually don't um, have the opportunity to get up. Yeah, sorry, next, yeah. So our our whole staff, um, I applied for a grant and we have this training call, it's for patient handling. And essentially it's um, giving us a screening tool for mobilization. So every time um, a staff member goes into a room, they would assess, not assess, sorry, they're going to screen the patient. And these are, these are little um, cards that they can use that PACE talks about. <clears throat> so they find out whether or not, you know, that they, if they're independent, depending on many things and what their limitations are. So then they can decide, okay, yes, I can get them up or I, yes, I can do this. So this is the pre-screening tool that they use to determine that mobility level. And everyone was trained. Next. So the key thing here is, this is what I had talked to specifically with the RN last week when we did a, a review and of the whole program. And she was, um, she was quite honest, which is really important because I told them at the beginning, please tell me um, if you, you know, anything, it's okay. So I've heard everything. And basically some of the natural opportunities that are there, we wanna create ways to encourage mobility. So if somebody's up in a chair and they're eating, they can get them to start doing some of these exercises. And they're not, another thing that we talked about too is maybe not labeling them as exercises, but more as functional mobility or independence. Because as you even saw from the video before, when somebody mentions a, a exercise, there's sort of a negative response to that with, with some older folks. And so we, if they're up in their chair, if they're getting their bed changed, if they're trying, if they're giving medication, you know, if they're, you know, at any time that they're moving or they're doing something, and especially if they're sitting up, because the exercises are simple. Um, you know, there's marching in a chair, so they'd be sit and they'd be marching. There's hand, you know, there's reaches, toe taps, very, very simple things, and they can do a lot of them in bed. 
So there's 10, but again, it's starting maybe just with one to make it work too. Next. So these were some of the barriers and this is what I'm working on right now. So people think that if they do move, um, you know, they might be hurt, you know, in terms of being moved around, but that's not going to happen. We have a lot of patients actually that do refuse and we know that that's their right. Um, sometimes there's a disagreement because I think when, when we, what we have to think about and changing a little tiny bit is the fact that when people come into the hospital, I think that, um, right away they think they're going to put everything down and someone's going to take care of them and that might be what we have shown them it, with what the culture is if that is the culture but it isn't and i think it's really important we change that culture but we have to include patients and families in terms of their understanding because families can also be someone that can come in and help out with this because i think it's really important because that once they they do get discharged they can go home and continue this program so again, I said it's for the population that's actually in bed. We have a walking team. So people that are able to ambulate actually can get up and ambulate on their own or with the walking team. Next. One, next again, something weird happened with that one. So here's what um, some of the barriers, creating that early mobilization protocol, extra, um, education, I think just educating, educating over um, training. <clears throat> Not everybody's an exercise person or can be an exercise coach, right? So there are some skills around that and the physio and I are gonna work together with the clinical nurse educator to do that. Talking about team communication, which we, we're pretty good because we have safety rounds and they do talk specifically about um, this program, the functional fitness piece. Screening them and knowing who's available and that came up and so now we have physio that comes in and will screen people. And we do have a couple champions now. And messaging is important in calling it functional fitness versus exercise. So that's a quick, quick version of it. Next. And we'll look for questions at the end. Thanks. And back to you, Kathy. Thank you very much for that, uh, Suzanne. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Vicki Komisar. And uh, Vicki is a postdoctoral fellow with the Injury Prevention and Mobility Laboratory at Simon Fraser University, where she works with Dr. Steve Rabinovich. Um, her research and development program focuses broadly on understanding how individuals interact with their environment to avoid falls and fall-related injuries, um, to drive the design of building codes, product design standards, and better assistive de technologies for preventing uh, falls and fall related injuries. She is currently gearing up to begin her new role in January as assistant professor at CBC, at UBC um, Okanagan campus and is looking for collaborators from all sectors. Please welcome Vicki. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to assume I'm not muted and we're all good. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, thank you very much, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about um, some recent work that I've done in my postdoctoral fellowship. Um, I've had the privilege of working with um, Steve Rabinovich's team for the last two and a half years or so, and some wonderful collaborators with the Fraser Health Authority. Um, and this is a sample from the latest work we've done that looks at um, the relationships between impacts and injuries to body parts. Uh, during falls and long-term care residents based on video analysis of real life falls. So why are we here? Um, well, falls are the leading cause of injury in older adults. Fall risk is higher in long-term care residents and about one in two older adults in long-term care will fall each year. Over 80% of injury related hospital visits in older adults are due to falls. And for injuries such as hip fractures and traumatic brain injuries, many older adults will never regain their autonomy and independence from before the fall. Now, despite these sobering statistics, it turns out that most falls do not result in injury. Um, my goal is to understand the factors that separate falls that result in injury from falls that do not uh, to guide strategies for injury prevention. One fundamental question related to injury risk is whether older adults fall in a way that reduces the risk for impact and injury to certain body parts. So I'm going to ask all of you to think through the last time you fell. Um, I'll make an educated guess that several of you impacted your arms on the ground or on other surfaces to stop the fall and avoid getting hurt. Um, and we call these responses protective responses. Um, so if you look toward the left of the slide, um, 
we have videos of a young adult who is using protective responses to keep her head from the crash pad. Um, so this includes a video on the left um, where she's using her arms in a forward fall and on the right she's using her arms and her torso and her neck muscles to stabilize herself in a backward fall. I'll now draw your attention to the right of the slide um, to juxtapose these responses with an older adult in long-term care. Um, I'm going to warn you that this is a real life fall with head impact, so it's a bit hard to watch. Um, so in this case, if I can find my mouse again. Okay. <laughs> um, so we can see that the resident attempts a protective response, but it fails and she impacts and injures her head. So to that end, um, we asked three questions in this project. Um, so the first was how often do impacts and injuries to body parts occur during falls in long-term care residents? Um, the second was, to what extent do impacts to body parts affect the risk for injury? So in other words, are certain um, body parts more likely to sustain injury than others when an impact occurs? And finally, um, how do impact patterns and landing strategies in long-term care residents differ based on the resident's landing direction? So to answer these questions, um, my team analyzed nearly 2,400 real-life falls by long-term care residents captured in video. We've maintained a partnership with two long-term care facilities with the Fraser Health Authority since 2007, which has allowed us to generate high quality evidence on the circumstances of falls. By using video evidence, we overcome several limitations of witness or faller recall in understanding what happened when the fall occurred. Um, all of the falls were captured in common areas, such as dining rooms and lounges. So we started by using a structured validated questionnaire to code videos for impact to body parts and the resident's landing direction. We then reviewed fall incident reports and progress notes for the resident for seven days after the fall. This allowed us to determine if injuries occurred, which body parts were injured, and the injury type. We also documented diagnostic and treatment outcomes, such as if sutures were required to treat lacerations. Finally, we used a linear mixed model to estimate body part impact and injury risk, how impact affected injury risk, and how landing direction affected impacts and injuries. So I'll start by walking you through some key resident characteristics. Don't read this entire thing here. Um, the main takeaways are that the average age was 84 years. Um, and also nearly 60% of the residents who fell were dependent in activities of daily living. Um, finally, dementia was common and about two thirds of residents in the sample had moderate to severe cognitive impairment. I'll now walk you through the injury pyramid of outcomes. Uh, so first, about 62% of falls involved no documented injury. An additional 34% of falls involved what we call moderate injuries. Uh, so this is where the resident was hurt, but hospitalizations or sutures or formal diagnostic procedures were not required. And then finally, 4% of falls unfortunately did result in severe injuries um, where the resident got, went to the hospital or got sutures or treatment for a fracture at a clinic. Um, let's now look at the relationship between impacts and injuries. So this graph shows the probability of body part impacts and injuries. Um, higher probabilities mean that the impact or injury to the body part was more likely. Um, so if you look at the top line, this is the blue triangles and line. This is the probability of impact to different body parts, um, while the red line at the bottom shows injury probability. So I'll start by directing your attention to the head on the far left. Um, the head was by far the least likely body part to impact, um, with a probability of 0.38. However, the head was also by far the most likely body part to get injured uh, relative to other body parts. I'll direct your attention now to the pelvis and the hips uh, around the middle. So we can see that the pelvis and the hips have the highest probability of impact. So what this means is that the residents impacted their pelvis and hips quite often during falls. Despite this, the probability of injury was comparatively small um, as it was with all other body parts except for the head. Let's look now at the how impact to body parts affected injury probability. So the horizontal axis of this graph shows different body parts, um, while the vertical axis shows the probability of body part injury. The dark red line shows the probability of injury in cases of where the body part was impacted during the fall. Um, and the black and salmon line sort of on the bottom shows injury risk where impact to the body part did not occur. Um, so the two takeaways here, uh, first was that uh, impacts to body parts increase the risk for injury for all body parts except for the pelvis. Um, and that is more to do with the fact that the pelvis uh, impacted pretty well in, in most falls. Um, we also see more importantly that impacts to the head were especially dangerous um, in that they had a much higher probability of resulting in injury compared to when other, 
other body parts sustained impact. Let's now look at landing direction. Um, so I also analyze injury probabilities, but I will focus on impacts here because the general patterns were similar. Um, so here we'll start at forward landings. Uh, this is what you're looking at. Um, so the most important points here first are that most forward landings involved hand and knee impact. Um, second, we also saw that impact to the head, the torso and the pelvis was less likely, but still quite probable at about one half. Um, so the takeaway here was that um, upper limb fall arrest, uh, which we identify through impacts to the hands and to some extent, um, the elbows, um, likely helped residents to avoid head, torso and pelvis impact in about one half of cases, um, suggesting that the strategy was often necessary but insufficient for arresting the fall. Um, and I'll show you some sample falls from long-term care to illustrate what these falling patterns look like in practice. Um, so again, I'll warn you that some of these are tough to watch. Um, so I will start with the case of a resident who falls forward, um, and we can see that he impacts his hands and his knees, um, and that this fall arrest strategy allowed him to avoid impact to the head, the torso, and the pelvis. On the right now, um, here's an example of an unsuccessful fall arrest. Um, so we could see that the woman here attempts to arrest the fall with her hands, um, but her arms collapse and her head, her torso, and her pelvis impact the ground. Let's look now at sideways and backward landings. Um, so I'm gonna handle these together because they share a few key similarities. Uh, so first, if you look toward the middle, uh, we can see that landing sideways or backward almost always involved hip or pelvis impact. Um, second, we can see if we look toward the far left, um, that the probability of head impact in backward or sideways landings was about one third. So this is lower than the one half that we saw in forward landings. If we now look toward the right of the graph, um, uh, where the uh, limbs are, um, we can see that impact to the uh, knees, elbows, and hands uh, was, are we sorry, we can see that impact to the elbows and hands was more common than head impact, um, though more so uh, during sideways falls. Um, so together, these impact patterns suggest that residents used a combination of upper limb arrest, um, but also that torso and neck control strategies also helped. Um, to show you an example of what this looks like, uh, here is a resident who is about to fall backward. Um, so we could see that while uh, his pelvis, we can see that while his pelvis, uh, or sorry, we can see that his pelvis, his torso, his elbows, and his hands impacted the ground. Um, and in this case, the neck muscles and his upper limbs, and to some extent, his core um, played a role in stabilizing the head to avoid head impact. So to summarize what I hope you've taken from this, uh, the first message is that most falls did not involve injuries, but injuries were still quite common, happening in about 38% of cases in the sample. Second, um, residents still often fell to avoid head impact. Um, this was the most vulnerable body part for injury. Um, and, oh, sorry, the most vulnerable part for injury, especially when impacts occurred. And finally, um, impact patterns differ by landing directions, highlighting the different strategies that residents used for fall arrest. Um, forward landings often involved upper limb and knee impacts in an attempt to avoid impact to the pelvis, the torso, and the head. Um, and conversely, backward and sideways landings almost always involved hip and pelvis impact, um, and residents used a combination of upper limb arrest and torso and neck musculature uh, to avoid head impact and likely injury. So in closing, I'd like to thank my funding sources, my collaborators, and the many volunteers who helped with video coding. Um, I'd especially like to thank our partner, Long-Term Care Homes, New Vista and Delta View. The last few months have been very difficult in long-term care, and we're really grateful for their ongoing partnership with this project. Uh, so this wraps things up, and I will be happy to take questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much, um, Vicki. Uh, great presentation. Um, we'll now move on to Kathleen Kulak. Kathleen is the Saskatchewan Liaison Officer for CAUT based in, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. She's a registered nurse with uh, a master's of nursing degree from their University of Saskatchewan. Please welcome Kathleen for her presentation on vitamin D supplementation for the prevention of falls and fractures in residents in long-term care. Kathleen. Great, thank you very much. Hi everyone, I want to start by acknowledging the land on which I am on today is Treaty 6 land, the traditional territory of the Cree peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. 
Uh, today I'm going to be covering a rapid review of the evidence on uh, the topic of vitamin D supplementation and the prevention of falls and fractures with residents in long-term care facilities. In terms of my disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. I am an employee of, Ca of Cadiz and I'm based here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, Cadiz itself is funded by provincial, federal and territorial ministries of health. And we receive application fees for two of our programs. I want to acknowledge the authors of the report that I'm going to be covering today, uh, Kai Tran and Robin Butcher, as well as extending uh, thanks to Kai who helped review these slides today. My learning objective for this quick presentation is to increase your understanding regarding the evidence for vitamin D supplementation in long-term care residents and its effects on falls and fall-related injuries. I'll give you a quick overview of CADIS in case you're not familiar. So CADIS is an independent national nonprofit organization. We're responsible for summarizing and collating evidence on a variety of clinical topics, including the one that we're talking about today. So the way that we do that at CADIS traditionally is through a process called health technology assessment. So these are large systematic methodical reviews of the evidence on individual topics, um, including meta-analysis and cost-effective analyses. And that's what we're most well known for. But also at CADIS, we have a program called our rapid response program. And as the name indicates, it's a rapid review of the evidence on a given topic. And the report that I'm gonna be covering today does come from our rapid response program. Um, and so because we're doing these uh, reviews rapidly, there are some limitations that I want to highlight before we get started. So traditionally in our rapid response program, we have um, one reviewer reviewing the citations that we find versus the typical two or more reviewers in a systematic review. Um, we generally only collect evidence within a certain time period for the rapid reviews, usually five or 10 years, just to uh, speed up the process. Uh, and that is how we get to the rapid, um, um, how we get to completing these rapid reviews. So uh, background, a little bit of background today, which of course, um, everyone is very familiar with this. Um, so falls among the elderly are a major source of fatal and non-fatal injury and impact quality of life. Uh, we saw in the previous presentation, we all know among Canadian long-term care residents, age 65 and older, it's estimated 50% of these individuals fall every year. Uh, we do know that vitamin D and calcium play a role in maintaining musculoskeletal health and a deficiency in vitamin D and calcium is associated with developing osteomalacia, osteoporosis and muscle weakness, which of course can lead to an increased chance of falls. And we do also know that residents long-term care are at an increased risk of a vitamin D and calcium deficiency. Naturally, there's been quite a few studies to look at the role that vitamin D supplementation can play in the prevention of falls and fall-related fractures. Uh, but over the years, this research has yielded uh, mixed results. And we can actually see at CADIS, this is a common question that we've received from clinicians and healthcare decision makers as to what role vitamin D can play. So here I have on the screen is numerous screenshots of uh, different reports that we've done over the years on vitamin D supplementation in this age group. And dating back, I only went back the past 11 years. Um, of all the reports that we've done on this topic, just because of all the evidence that is available in this space and um, the clarity that's required. So today I'm just gonna be covering the results that we have in our most recent report on this topic that you can see here on the screen. Um, this was completed April 30th, 2019. So the results that I'm sharing with you today are only current to that date, of course. So these were the questions that were posed to our research team in terms of this topic, essentially looking at what is the clinical and cost effectiveness of vitamin D supplementation for the prevention of falls and fractures in elderly patients in long-term care. And there was also a question about um, what are the evidence-based guidelines re regarding the, that same question. So this report is freely accessible on our website at cadiz.ca. I have the link here on the screen, but you can easily search it in our database and you can get the full report in details. Um, for you to view. So in terms of um, how we actually conducted this review, so a limited literature search was conducted on key resources that were published between January 1st, 2014 and um, March 29th, 2019. So we had that five-year limit in terms of literature. One reviewer screened the citations and selected the studies. We had very specific inclusion criteria for the research that we included in this review. Um, so that included seniors residing in a long-term care facility, so we excluded community-dwelling older adults. It had to be some form of vitamin D supplementation, and we were interested in any formulation and any dose, or 
um, looking as a comparator, no vitamin D supplementation. And we were uh, specifically looking at the effectiveness of that, safety and cost effectiveness. And so we specifically were selecting um, other systematic reviews, health technology assessments, randomized control trials and guidelines, of course. So when we put those parameters into our search strategy, we ended up with a total of 170 citations. And when we applied that inclusion criteria, we ended up with six relevant articles to include in our rapid review. And you can see what those are on the screen. Uh, the, um, I wanna highlight um, the systematic review that we used. It included eight primary studies in its analysis. And the randomized control trial that was included in this review was specifically looking at high dose vitamin D supplementation. Um, for residents of long-term care. So this was residents receiving 100,000 units per month of vitamin D. So a critical appraisal was done of all the included studies to ensure of their quality. So the quality of the systematic review was considered high. Uh, its research methodology, methodology was quite rigorous and um, it was conducted by Cochrane, for those of you who are familiar with Cochrane. The quality of the randomized control trial was considered moderate. The quality of the economic study was considered high. And the guideline quality was mixed in this case. Uh, two of the guidelines had more methodological limitations um, than the third guideline that was included. And a full review of that critical appraisal is in the report. So what did we find? What new evidence was there available on this um, hot topic that we've looked at several times over the years? So when we analyzed the pooled data that was located in the systematic review, the review did show a reduced rate of falling or a reduced rate in the number of falls by 28% for those individuals who are receiving vitamin D supplementation from 800 units to 1100 units per day. Uh, when, specifically when we we're looking at the randomized control trial, it actually found that those individuals that were receiving high dose vitamin D, 100,000 units per month, they, that actually increased their incident rate of falls by uh, as much as 133% compared to a standard dose of vitamin D. So um, high dose uh, vitamin D in this randomized control trial, this one randomized control trial did show an increased rate of falls. However, generally in that pool data in that systematic review, there was a decrease in the rate of falls. Um, the pool data in the systematic review review also looked at um, the risk of falling um, as well as the risk of fracture. And pool data from that systematic review actually re revealed no significant difference in the risk of falling between groups, or essentially there was no significant difference between groups for the number of people falling. The pool data also did not show a difference in the number of individuals having fall-related fractures. Unfortunately, there was no pool data available on the number, on the rate or the number of fractures. Uh, in the systematic review. And um, positively enough, no adverse events were reported um, in any of the studies included in that systematic review. In terms of cost effectiveness, um, the economic study did show that vitamin D is a cost effective option. Um, vitamin D supplementation dominated no intervention or hip protectors in terms of incremental cost per fall avoided. So essentially what that's saying is vitamin D compared to nothing or vitamin D compared to hip protectors, in this case was found to be less costly and more um, effective. And in terms of the evidence-based guidelines that were included in this review, there was unanimous recommendation for vitamin D supplementation in, uh, for fall and fracture prevention in long-term care residents. So where does this leave us at the end of the day? Um, I, I think the look on that man's face might sum it up. Uh, so there is some evidence to suggest that uh, vitamin D supplementation may reduce the number of falls. So the total of number of falls may be decreased with vitamin D supplementation. But it, in this case, in this evidence we have today, had little or no effect on that actual number of individuals that are falling or the number of fall-related fractures. Um, so essentially, we came to a similar conclusion that we had when we reviewed this evidence previously um, in that um, there's some, sort of some mixed results. Um, now, this goes to say this doesn't necessarily um, impact the way we were doing practice. Um, like I said, there was no adverse events reported in any of these cases. Um, so it really comes back to doing that thorough medication review and, and determining what is best for the patient in these cases um, in terms of vitamin D supplementation. And uh, as always, more research is needed on the topic. Thank you. And I'll take questions at the end.
Thank you, Thank Kathy. You. Um, so with, without further ado, I'll introduce our last two speakers of the day. Um, Wendy Thompson is a senior, they're both from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and Wendy Thompson is the senior epidemiologist and manages two analytical teams, one focusing on injury surveillance and the other one focusing on healthy living surveillance. Joanne Boatwater is a policy analyst within the Division of Aging, Seniors and Dementia and has been working in the field of health promotion and policy and research for the last 20 years. Um, so without further ado, Joanne and Wendy. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here today to have this uh, opportunity to present to you at this virtual conference. Um, again, my name is Joanne Bowater, I'm a policy analyst. Um, and just to situate you a little bit with um, within the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, so I'm located within the Centre for Health Promotion um, and my colleague Wendy, who will be presenting as well with me, um, is located within the Centre for Surveillance and Applied Research. So different centers um, within our branch, but we work um, very closely together. So, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna. So today, um, our presentation, Seniors Falls in Canada. So as most of you know, in 2014, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada released uh, a report entitled Seniors Falls in Canada. So today's presentation um, is going to be sharing some preliminary data from an updated analysis um, of seniors falls data, looking at uh, mortality and hospitalization uh, data, emergency department visits, as well as self-reported falls. Uh, as well, efforts by FAC to contribute to the prevention of falls and related injuries will also be discussed. And often throughout the presentation, you will hear me say FAC just because it's less to say. So moving along to an overview. So most of you on this presentation and this um, conference today is very familiar with um, these statistics. So I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. Um, as we know, seniors age 65 plus comprise a sizable share of the population and that number is only uh, going to increase as we know. Uh, injuries resulting from falling have an enormous impact on the health and quality of life of older adults. As well, they have a significant um, physical and mental health consequences for older adults, their families, as well as uh, care providers. We know that falls are the leading cause of older adult uh, traumatic brain injuries and result in large costs in healthcare services to treat the impact of falls and resulting injuries. So as the focal point um, for seniors fall prevention activities within the federal government, um, FAC works to raise awareness of the factors contributing to falls and provide up-to-date information tracking how um, and when these falls occur. I'm going to pass it over to Wendy. Okay, so my name is Wendy Thompson. Um, I'm going to go through, it's a little bit data heavy, our slide. So I'm going to apologize in advance, but happy um, we will have a report coming out. Um, so we'll go through the injury pyramid. Our fatal injuries, um, we have vital stats data, injury resulting from hospitalizations. We get it from the discharge abstract data or the provinces themselves. Um, and we have national coverage for that. Emergency room data, I also manage a Canadian Hospitals Injury Reporting and Prevention Program, CHIRP, which is in 11 pediatric hospitals and now 12 general hospitals. It's a sentinel surveillance system. But um, CAIHI has a national ambulatory care reporting system. I will tell you, it is not national. Um, coverage comprehensively is Yukon, Alberta, and Ontario. And then it's spotty with select hospital emergency departments reporting um, across Canada. But um, the challenge is that the I guess the mechanism of the injury is not available for a lot of those other hospitals. Um, we have physician billing files or um, electronic healthcare records for primary care, um, other sentinel surveillance systems, and then injuries treated outside the healthcare system. Oftentimes at a national level, we use uh, survey data on that. And then the near miss injuries, um, I saw a presentation of who um, earlier who fell, but didn't have injuries. We get some of that from um, the Canadian Community Health Survey on falls, but oftentimes we're 
because I'm injury surveillance, we're more interested in um, the burden of injury. So oftentimes you don't see the impact that prevention has or um, on the injuries, though you hope that it does. It, it's hard to say how much injury is being prevented. So next slide, please. So we're going to go um, according to the injury pyramid. I'm going to walk through it again. I walk quickly because I only have 10 minutes, but fall related deaths. And I will apologize again that we're using 2015 at the moment for the vital stats data. Um, though we have uh, cans and tables, if you want to look at StatsCan puts out, they, you can see some of the leading causes, but the in-depth analysis that we want to do, even at the public health agency, um, StatsCan is a little bit behind in getting us that data. So for purposes of this analysis, and uh, it will be updated in an upcoming report that we're going to be doing on seniors falls. Um, but right now it was just on 2015, um, this data. So the figures are just in placement and the title of the figures are in placement of a report that um, two members of my team, Felix and Yusuf, were kind enough to uh, pull together. So you have falls accounting for 60, approximately 65% of unintentional injuries. And you have almost about 3,600, a little bit over 3,600 deaths in 2015 among seniors that were due to a fall. So you can see um, the number of cases increasing. You have males in the gray and females in the yellow. So females are slightly higher in terms of uh, mortality rates and the number of deaths for um, those 65 and over for all years going back from 2001. Next slide, please. So apologize again if this is a little bit harder to see. We're trying to cram um, different uh, data, but comparatively for hall, fall hospitalizations. And this is from Kaihai, the discharge abstract data set. And we're going back on um, the one slide on the left hand slide, you're going back to 2015 to 2018. That is the current year 2018. Our data set um, that we'll recently have, uh, we just received it is 2019 to March 2020. So this is 2017 to March 2018. And so you can see um, the trend in the fall related hospitalizations um, for those 65 and over and relatively stable. Some changes, the total of number um, has increased when you look at the total number. Um, but then you look at for when you're looking at the fall related hospitalizations and then you have the overall rate, the crude rate. And so although it has increased, it wasn't um, as significant of an incline as we might have expected for hospitalizations, um, considering the aging population. So then you also have um, just a snapshot of the fiscal year of 2018, seeing both men and women increasing and seeing which age groups increase the most. Because I think when you lump all seniors together of just looking at 65 and over, you can't tease out those nuances in those hospitalizations, the rates. We don't have a lot of more detail um, with hospitalizations. We do have... Um, how they fall a little bit in depending on the variables and the completeness and the quality of those variables. And some of them uh, vary depending on provinces. If you find that most of them and most of the fall related hospitalizations actually occurred at home or uh, residential care. Next slide, please. And so these are fall related visits to emergency departments. And again, keep in mind when we're talking about emergency departments, though I am using the National Ambulatory Care Reporting System for this data, it is actually only Ontario and Alberta. Yukon had too small of numbers to present. And Yukon, um, all of on Alberta and all of Ontario are represented. And you can tease out the fall related emergency departments. In other hospitals reporting, you can say if it was a fracture or the health outcome, but I often don't get, um, you're not able to see the mechanism of injury. So when you look across, um, you have the ED visits and you also have the, um, the crude rate. So the total number of the fall related ED visits increased um, significantly from 20, 2002 to 2018. 
And so um, it was significant, it was statistically significant, and it was also for um, both males and females. So in general, when you look at the right-hand side, you're going to see um, with age, the different age breakdowns, and you have those for males, those for females, and then you have both sexes combined. So you see a little bit more of, even though mortality for females um, was a little bit higher, that is also related to the leading cause. So we do have a leading cause of hospitalizations paper out. We are updating our leading cause of um, mortality, not leading cause of all cause mortality, and even in, um, specifically injury hospitalizations and injury mortality. So you do see a significant difference as well um, when you go and you break it down, not necessarily as much for emergency departments between sexes, but you do see it between emergency departments between the age groups. Next slide, please. And so then you go into the Canadian Community Health Survey. And though this survey is asked every year, um, we can only get every second year um, for the territories, but we can only present at a national level when all provinces buy into that survey. So um, the last, when we had um, national coverage of the falls in, is, was in 2017-2018. So you had... Um, 350,000 older Canadians reported experiencing a fall. Um, those who, comparing to those who did not, um, they're more likely to be female. They were less likely to be age 74 and younger. So when you actually look at the trends of increasing rates now, the Canadian Community Health Survey is a self-reported survey that um, it's representative, it's nationally representative, and they have um, weights to different age groups as well as different sexes and across provinces. So we can tease out differences that we're, uh, we're looking at now in the provincial breakdowns. And so what we did find out is um, that the increasing rates of self-reported injuries um, between the ages of 70 and 89. And so you also had in 2017, there were rates the highest among seniors were 85 to 89. And then at um, seniors at 70, um, for injuries due to falls. Um, so you can see the different, there was a slight increase. Um, it was statistically significant, the difference between um, 85 to 89, comparing to our reference was 65 to 69. And so you can see some of the nuances, but in, in our reporting, our self-reporting, we had a de decrease um, not statistically significant in those 70 to 74 compared to 65 to 69. And so in from the community, Canadian Community Health Survey, we found that 39% um, of older Canadians who sustained an injury reported that they were walking when the injury occurred. Um, some of them were walking outside. We do have a lot of them was a slip on fall on an ice or they were walking, they could have been dizzy and they had fallen. So we're looking at um, compared to outside, um, compared to weather events, but also there was a high number of rate that they fell within their home or residential care. So the most common injury site was shoulder or upper arm followed by knee or lower leg. And then 73% of those uh, saw treatment at emergency room and or um, physician. So the impact of our healthcare system, they were, they did fall and they did seek out treatment. So it wasn't that they fell and didn't report it somehow or didn't seek treatment. We also had um, differences in comparing over years, um, which is challenging sometimes with uh, the staff can survey as they redesigned um, their questionnaire and some of their uh, comparability. So we can't follow that trend up over time. Um, but we are looking to try to see some of the questions that we can in comparison to, because it's important to look at not only for those years period, but to see how that changes over time. And as I said, even though you have an aging population, um, which are the, where they, the biggest thing is where did the injury happen and how did that injury happen? And so this is what we're trying to find out with a few more questions, different questionnaires. Um, if you go to the next slide. 
So before uh, Joanne follows up with um, some of the, the role in our surveillance, we did look at, um, my team did a very, very large 150-page uh, document, and it's called Injury and Review, and it's uh, Traumatic Brain Injuries across Canada and across the life course. So what you can find if you actually Google that is looking across the life course and particularly in seniors, not coming from um, a falls perspective of how many um, had traumatic brain injuries as a result of the fall, but going back from how many um, seniors who had traumatic brain injuries, but the cause of that was a fall. And so in the seniors population, when you look at the health outcome of traumatic brain injuries, you find that um, the leading cause of the traumatic brain injuries was a result from a fall, and it was a forward-facing fall. So in saying that, um, both the Center for Health Promotion and the Center for Surveillance and Applied Research are trying to increase not only the quality of the data that we get, we, we have limited in terms of what Kai High collects, but in terms of what we can through a Canadian Hospitals Injury Reporting Prevention Program, but also with our surveys, um, we have a rapid response in the field now on head injuries and concussions across all age groups. And we're looking at soon getting the data on a more comprehensive falls analysis to be able to provide and analyze that data and report on it. So I'll turn it back to Joanne and thank you everybody for your time. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so in terms of FACS role in fall prevention and surveillance, um, the federal government recognizes that falls are one of the most costly and complex injury issues um, facing seniors. So as you can see from the slide that's up right now, um, where is my, yeah. um, so FAC leads federal efforts on fall prevention through um, three key areas. So collaboration with stakeholders and partners. This would be um, promoting the what works by identifying and sharing best practices, as well as raising public awareness of the risk factors that contribute to older adult falls and how to prevent them and ensuring um, the continued availability of national level data. So just to provide you with some specific examples of some key health promotion efforts that um, are currently underway at the Public Health Agency, looking at collaboration with stakeholders and partners. Um, so in 2018-2020, FAC uh, provided funding to Parachute Canada for its Pan-Canadian Seniors Fall Prevention Network project. So in collaboration with other key um, injury prevention stakeholders, Parachute created an online hub, um, making it easier for Canadians and health professionals to access fall prevention resources. I have included the link there as well, and I encourage you um, to check it out. So FAC as well collaborates with provinces and territories, as well as the World Health Organization, to promote the uptake and implementation of age-friendly communities throughout Canada. So we recognize that, um, that safe and supportive environments are crucial for healthy aging and the AFC initiative is an effective model to support uh, the health inclusion and well-being of older Canadians. I'm not going to get in because I don't have time to the eight different domains of an age-friendly community. If you would like more information, please do reach out to me. Um, but there's definitely some natural linkages between AFC domains uh, and key risk factors for falls among seniors. Some of the more obvious Links um, with fall prevention are the ones that touch on environmental and socioeconomic um, fall risk factors. Again, most of you are well aware of our, um, our publications that are available free of charge on our website. Um, there's the Safe Living Guide, You Can Prevent Falls. Um, as we mentioned, the Seniors Falls in Canada report. Stay tuned for um, the Seniors Falls interim report, hopefully coming out in spring 2021 from the data that we've just shared. Um, and as well, continued availability of national level data, and I won't get into it because Wendy has touched on um, the traumatic brain injuries report. So thank you for your time. There is our contact information if you would like to reach out to Wendy or myself. Thank you very much, um, Wendy and, and Joanne, and uh, thanks to um, all of our presenters today. Um, I very much enjoyed your presentations. Unfortunately, we are running over, um, over time, so we don't have time for any of the questions. Um, all the presentations were, have been recorded and will be on, um, I believe it's the Parachute website. 
Um, if not, uh, somebody can correct me tomorrow. Um, the other thing is that uh, we had lots of questions about um, where the uh, videos are, and I would encourage everybody to go to the Parachute website and uh, watch the remaining uh, two videos. So um, that's it for today. Um, I hope everybody has a have a safe uh, safe day the rest of the day, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow. Oh, remember to uh, fill in your evaluation form. Thanks, Michael, for putting it up there. <laughs>